This video is brought to you by Holocasa. Our tool transforms independent local real estate agents to global real estate agents. Create your own profile for free and get contacted by international investors. Sign up with the link in the description. Hello and welcome everyone to our 128th session of Holocasa. My name is Michael and today I'm talking to Federico Gallardo, founder and CEO of Fitchum Capital in Montevideo, uh, Uruguay. It's a real estate development company operating in Latin America and US with over 35 years of experience across international business, corporate governance, and real estate. It has held senior ex executive roles at companies like NCR, Apple, and Microsoft. He's also an active venture capital investor and frequent speaker on real estate and leadership. Peter, thank you so much for your time today. I'm really pumped to have you on the show. I've, I told you before, I've been uh, looking for someone from Argentina and the Uruguay region for a while. No one wanted to come on the show. So finally, I have someone who has a lot of experience and can tell me about the latest trends there. So the floor is yours. Why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, Michael. Thank you very much for the time and the invitation. So, well, here I am based in, in Uruguay, but I'm Argentinian from Orange. So I lead this company, which has 18 plus years on the market. I founded in 2006 um, after retiring from Microsoft, being 12 years there, very young at that moment. And we are uh, real estate developers. We, we, we are focused on middle class residential buildings for sale. Up to now, we are already exploring multifamily. And that's our focus. We have been working a lot in the last years to refine our product. And we are today very focused on sustainable buildings, as edge certified with lots of technology in, in all the units with IoT. And basically that's our focus today. Perfect, thank you so much. Give us first and foremost, maybe an overview of the current market situation of Montevideo, but also the entire region. I know it's quite, a region which is one huge hub on the global level, Paraguay, um, Uruguay, and Argentina, the entire Buenos Aires region. What's the status regarding real estate at the moment there? Okay. Um, Uruguay is the lowest risk country in the region by far. It, it's, it, today it's like 85, 86 basis points even 100 points below the U.S. And so that's a country risk of Uruguay. It's a very stable economy with a macro consensus that's been long for many decades already. And so business here is very stable, very predictable. And Paraguay is one of the lowest risk countries. In fact, it has been upgraded to investment grade. Uruguay is already an investment grade country. And Paraguay has 170 basis point of country risk, even below the U.S. also, and um, <clears throat> very stable economy. Paraguay has the oldest uh, currency in Latin America. So the Guarani, that is a currency in, in Paraguay, it's a currency that has been there for more than 80 years without nobody touching it. People save money in Guaranies. It's a great country, lots of opportunities in Paraguay. It's a growing population. Uruguay is a very stable population, more European countries. Uh, Paraguay is growing a lot in terms of population uh, and, and lots to develop in, in Paraguay in many senses. Uh, Argentina, it's a, sorry. Go ahead, please, sorry. Uh, Argentina is the, the difficult uh, picture in the photo. So they, they have, um, Argentina has a very unstable economy or has had a very unstable economy for the last, last 70 years uh, with many ups and downs, defaults and high inflation, uh, very unpredictable business in general, but has given investors with risk resilience, some windows of opportunity to do very good businesses now in the last 10 months has entered a new era with this new very liberal um, center-right government libertarian if they call themselves not liberal with a very open economy and it's really under a very profound change in every sense taxes regulations so that the country is really going under a huge transformation that 
if everything continues well, Argentina will be one of the most free countries in the world in the next five to 10 years. So we are hoping for that to happen. So th that's basically the, the region, the South Cone, I would say today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, very first question regarding Montevideo. How come it has been, and also maybe Paraguay, but you also pointed out Montevideo, uh, Montevideo and Uruguay especially, regarding the stability. Is it that the government has always been the same? Is it because it has very de democratic? Sorry for my ignorance, but I would like to understand there, what is it basically, which has it made it so stable over the decades? Well, the, uh, Uruguay is a small country. It has 3.5 million inhabitants. <clears throat> um, um, it's a country made of immigrants, the same as whole, most of Latin America, mostly Spanish and Italians. Um, um, and uh, the country has had a, 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 a institutional consensus for many decades already. The last uh, important crisis, economic crisis, has been in year 2002, that it was really pushed by the Argentinian crisis, in fact. But, but since then, this, the economy has been, it has 22 years already of very high stability. But the, it, it's a very, has a very solid institutional uh, back end. So the democracy here is very, very strong dialogue between the different parties is very open it's a very secure country and it's a very open economy uh, paraguay uruguay produces very little very small quantity of things so they it mostly imports everything except agriculture and uh, and tourism which are uh, and which are the two main sources of income and and I don't know how you call them that paper producing plants that come from forests. They, I don't know how you call this in English. So th those are like the three main sources of income. The rest or most of the rest, it's imported in the country. Very open economy. <clears throat> and I think that the most important thing that it has a social consensus. So over the, the macro uh, uh, things of the economy, the policies, and, and political um, institutions. So, and historically it has been like that. So the country has a really, it's, it's a very predictable uh, country in terms of politics, in terms of economy, and, and institutions. Perfect. Very, very secure for businesses in general. Makes total sense. I remember when I was talking, traveling to Uruguay and I was, I felt like home. I really liked the people in Montevideo. I went to Punto de Diablo, I think it's called. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed the entire society and, uh, and the young people there. Now, regarding Argentina, for everyone maybe who is not that as much, as close as you regarding the change there. We know, we read a lot of news. We also never know what of the news are real and what is basically fake. Give us an overview, basically, what has happened during the past 12 months from where has Argentina been and then where is basically supposed to go? I know you cannot give that in five minutes, but maybe give us a like sort of an idea of what we are, what you are experiencing there. Okay, Argentina has undergone <clears throat> very far left governments in the last, I don't know, fifteen to twenty years, with the exception of a period from two thousand sixteen to two thousand and nineteen, in which there was a center right center focused government but with that exception the other 16 years uh, it has been a, a country going under huge regulations social uh, plans of all kinds and and the state giving away money like crazy um, printing money like crazy uh, being uh, very unaligned with with businesses and 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 entrepreneurs, and like fighting capitalism and well, it's been a mess. So the the country was really it was a very closed economy for many years, with very high inflation. We finished last year with more than two hundred and fifty percent inflation. The currency is 
it, it's worth nothing basically or it was worth nothing and the society was very tired i would say of, of all this process and with and and with this policies like intervened in in every institution in the country the congress in the justice in, in, in the economy and the executive power everywhere so basically in december we had an election where an independent came up um, called javier Milei. Uh, it's a i would say a, a i wouldn't say a far right but it's a strong right movement uh, and they call themselves liberal and they gathered the vote of um, mostly young people and it was really a surprise and, and nobody, nobody saw it coming really and he, his campaign was basically focused on social media with very low and unexistent budget and they came out winning and they and this guy Javier was basically reflecting in the campaign what people was feeling so people were feeling so he was uh, he, his messages were with filled of anger and frustration, and 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 he has he uses a very harsh kind of talk, speaking, public speaking. So he's really harsh. Uh, sometimes he insults. So that's a part like that that I don't like really. But but he's expressing what people feel really, and people like that. Uh, he's open. He's transparent, uh, and he promotes votes free speech uh, open an open economy and and uh and, and people have liked that, that a lot the the weak part of the equation is that the con the, the the election uh in the congress was not as good as the presidential election uh, if we are here we have two rounds and he got like 30 something percent of the votes uh, and in the second round he won the presidency but in the first round is where, where you define deputies and senators and so he has a very small 15 percent of the low chamber and i don't know like 10 percent of the high chamber the senators so he's governing with a huge minority or a very small minority in the congress which makes it a little bit harder and he has to negotiate very many, many things so we are all waiting for um good election next year where we have the middle term elections where uh, another part of the congress will be replaced and perhaps if he, if he gets a higher percentage of both chambers he will ha have more power to introduce stronger reforms uh, in the state the other thing that happened in the last 20 years that the spend the state spent so the government spent grew like crazy from 25% of the GDP to 42, 43% of the GDP in 20 years. So basically we were full of taxes and it was impossible to make business in Argentina. So yeah. that is starting to change. It's going to take a while. I think no, not less than five to 10 years to start seeing real changes in the economy. But today there are huge opportunities, and if if there are investors who have the stomach and the guts to wait, I, I think there are huge opportunities everywhere. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I listened to a couple of talks for him. I'm highly impressed, and I support most of the things which I have understood so far, meaning reduction of government spend and all the corrupt people basically only. Yeah. Eating up the taxpayers, very strong capitalistic approach regarding allowing businesses to flourish, uh, opening up to the economy, creating ease of doing business, um, reducing taxes, reducing corporate taxes, and also making sure that basically like that innovation is going to grow, especially with the backbone of the strong education and young, highly educated people, which uh, Argentina is famous for. It's basically just, and I understand that he is getting angry with that because I would too, if you have such a strong brain drain from Argentina, because the government is doing everything so that you cannot do business. And it's just basically trying to exploit you as, as much as possible. So I am a huge fan of Millet and I hope it's going to turn around uh, Argentina, which 
since I'm basically aware of the country and I'm born or old enough to consider Argentina, it's basically just a failed state, which is unfortunate because it belongs to a totally different ranking in, in South America. Coming now to your company, because you gave a key word regarding investment opportunities, Vitrum Capital. Give us an overview there. What is it? What you're doing? Who are you serving? And what are your main services? So we, as I told you before, we are a <clears throat> real estate development company focused on the middle class with um, residential uh, apartments for sale. We are now starting to explore opportunities for introducing multifamily projects in Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, Colombia, and several other countries. We are very focused on sustainability. So four years ago, we made a decision to certify every project with uh, EDGE. And, and the company next year will be carbon neutral certified, which is a huge step for us. And in the next six years, we have taken the commitment to be carbon neutral in every project we build. Our, our responsibility with the environment is very high and our commitment is very high. We have a group within the company that is focused on that uh, and is focused both on sustainability and innovation. Part of our my DNA uh, comes from technology also. So my first 16 years working were on the technology industry. Many of them, 12 years at Microsoft. So my 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 DNA is mostly built up with technology. So we have introduced a lot of technology in our projects with IoT and, and services surrounding that for property owners. And, and we are working on expanding that. And, and we have done lots of things and we are introducing new technologies with AI also. That's basically it. We have uh, offices in four countries today. We are, that's Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, and the US, and we are planning to open Colombia and Peru in the next couple of years. Um, our objective is to be a diversified option for investors around the world who want to invest in Latin America and have a easy tool to invest and, and, and portfolio to invest in several countries. Uh, we work mostly with um, individuals and family offices around the world and have been working for over 18 years, 18 years with this model. And, and we are happy and growing in every country and have a long-term vision with, with this. Perfect. Makes sense. So in a nutshell, the way I can understand it, you do the, the due diligence regarding location, land. You make sure that basically you find a good area you define what you want to build there. You get all the construction and architects and designers on board. You get obviously also the funding via the investors. And then basically you build it, you construct it with a certain purpose. And then the investors directly own a certain unit. No, we have like several models. You, we, every project for us is an SPV. <clears throat> So we don't work as a fund. So we are like an investment manager. So our vehicle for investment is real estate. But our, I would say our core business is uh, investment management. So for every project, we create an SPV. Um, we build an investment memo. We go out to talk with investors, present the opportunity. If investors like the opportunity, they come into the project with equity. And, and they stay with us as partners for the whole development. We are pure developers, so we don't do construction, architecture, everything. We uh, subcontract everything. And we have uh, strong reporting tools for our investors to be on top of their investments every quarter. And we do frequent calls with them. And basically, our investor, we have like different kinds of investors, the ones that at the end of the project, stay with units and they rent them and we manage if they want that, that those rentals for them. Those are like long-term rental investors. 
Then we have the investors that would like to reinvest their money. They are happy with what they did and they want to renew their investment in other projects. And then there are ones who, that that want to exit with cash. They went, they 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 wait uh, until the the projects are uh, finished and, and sold. The projects are very conservative in terms of funding, so we leverage like thirty five percent of the cost of a project. So uh, it's a very small leverage, and we mostly work with equity and then pre sales. Obviously, uh, when you go to market. And we do lots of innovation. We, we like to put creati- creativity in the kind of projects we do. We did like some projects with mixed use and besides the residential part. And, and we like to work a lot on architecture and, and the services and the, the platform we deliver to the community uh, because we see this uh, as, a, uh, as something that stays in the city for the next 100 years or more. So we are very conscious on, on what we create for the community in the long term. How many do you have in your portfolio which are already undergone the, undergone the entire process, basically? Not right now to sell on market, but basically your trajectory during the last... last... So we have 12 projects that are, have been finished and delivered. And we have currently eight projects under development that different stages, pre-sale, construction, or about to finish. And we have two projects being funded at this moment, and we are going to deliver in the uh, launch to the market, sorry, in the next two or three months. So we have like different stages and we are planning for to launch uh, perhaps four projects next year, also in in three countries. Uh, that might be Uruguay, Paraguay, Colombia, and Peru, most probably. How can I invest when I am, or if I am interested to um, invest in one of your projects? Okay, so we, when you get in touch with us, one of our investment management management professionals will get in touch with you and will show you the projects we are currently funding. So they will share with you our performa, our investment memo. It's a 14, 15 page document which describes the project and the performa and the, the cash flows and the RIR. And everything we have studied on the project we want to do. And basically, they, you will discuss with them everything you need to know about the country, the region, the market, and, and the expectations on the project. And we will sign, if you are okay with the investment and you like it, we will sign a contract, an investment contract with you, uh, with all the terms and conditions that basically follow what the investment memo says. And you will, once you sign the contract, you will transfer uh, the equity to whichever account the project has. And um, after that, we will stay in touch with you every three months. As soon as we launch the project to the market, we will invite you to come to the launch. If you don't want to come, you will see it online. And basically after that, we will keep, keep you posted quarterly on the, on the advance and on, on everything that is happening on the project with a report that is another 15 pages where we show um, approvals, construction, progress, all, all the legal and accounting status of the partnership, the updated performa uh, with the current numbers versus the investment memo numbers. And news on the market, what's happening, sales, what we've sale, sold, if we have taken already or when we take the, the loan with the bank, which is the status of that loan, uh, and then how the project closes uh, as we get to the end of it. And well, it's a, it's a typically a 3.5 to 4 year process. Usually uh, a project like this has an IRR for the investor between 10 uh, and 12 after tax, um, after tax in the country, right? So, uh, and that's a return on investment of approximately 
between 45 and 50%, depending on the project. Over the years. So basically what I can imagine, you say, perfect, you want to invest into this project. This is the minimum. How much is the minimum, which I have to... Usually we are around $200,000 and up. <clears throat> yeah. $200,000. Uh, 200000 200, $200, invested. You can basically, you are send us the, the term sheet. You, I'm basically becoming an LP, is that correct? Like limited partner on in, in legal terms? Yeah. You, you are a partner in the, in the SPV. Yeah. Okay. Then you have a fiduciary a bank account or a direct a Citibank bank account, transfer the money here. It's saved. Yep. It's basically this money is locked for this purpose. And yep. then you guarantee, is the return guaranteed or is it just yep. expected? It's, it's expected. expected. Yeah, you're a partner on the partnership in the LP. We are the GP usually and the return is expected. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I can, after how many years can I uh, retrieve the money for the first time? As soon as the construction finishes, that usually that's at the end of the third year, depending on how much we've sold, usually you have lots of payments that are due when you deliver the units. So all that money that comes in to the SPV, you first pay to the bank your loan. And once you've finished paying to the bank, everything that's on the account is distributed within the partners. And if you have some units that haven't been sold still, so as we sell and deliver those units, we will continue distributing till the last unit is sold. So that's basically a typical structure. Yeah. Um, okay. So if, if some yeah. partners want to stay with unit uh, at the end of the project, when the project uh, at the end of the construction, uh, so when the building is finished, they just send it an instruction to exchange what they have to uh, to get in exchange for units. Uh, generally, we reserve an escrow uh, amount on the whole distribution just for unexpected additional costs. For example, if the units you haven't sold are uh, last more than predicted in order to sell, so uh, we just leave an escrow and that escrow is distributed at the end of the project uh, once all the units have it sold. Yeah. yeah, okay, makes sense. You say right now you have around 20 or 12, uh, 15 projects on your in your portfolio, which are ongoing? Or under you... development? Well, yes. Under development, we have six. Six right now. Okay. So it, yeah. And when I, because I'm looking at your website and I see right now more, uh, over, that's why I was asking like around 20. Those are the, there are a couple of them, they are already basically sold. Like when I look at, for example, number one, Villa, 81 opportunities for your lifestyle, zero one villa, basically is right now still ongoing. Um, so we have two those... zero one villas. So we have zero one villa in Paraguay that is in, in pre-sale today. And then yes. we have zero one villa in Uruguay, which is under construction already. So it depends on the projects. There are like different states. Different okay. Stages. So, uh, okay. I'm looking right now at the one in, uh, in Uruguay. So basically I could still go hop in and be part of it and invest along or is it no. already okay not as already. an equity partner because that that closed a couple of years ago when we were about to purchase the, the land you can buy units today uh, we have several investors who only buy units um, that they want to stay for rent <clears throat> so that but there are the projects that we are about to launch in the next months that we are currently funding. So it's, it depends on the stage of the project that you are, that you are looking at. Yeah, I understand. There, there is one project in particular that we are going to launch next week that is not there still. It will appear mm -hmm. on a 26th. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Perfect. I also see the difference now between the one in Uruguay and the one in Paraguay. It's a different yeah. also investment opportunity, which makes all the sense. For foreign investors, I'm aware of the fact that this is also a huge target audience for you. There's no, is there anything I have to take into account other than when I'm not from Uruguay or from no, Argentina? The, um, <clears throat> interesting. <clears throat> Both um, 
many countries in Latin America have tax treaties with uh, European countries. Mm -hmm. But for example, Uruguay has a very special law that is quite appealing. So we uh, we built under that law. That is, uh, it's called promoted housing law. Under that law, any project you develop in Uruguay, a real estate project, it pays zero income tax, <clears throat> and and it pays zero dividends tax. So uh, when I tell you that the project delivers between 45 and 50% return on investment, that is net. So yes. um, it comes out of Uruguay without paying taxes. So if you have to pay taxes in your country, it's uh, something you have to see locally, uh, but the country has no taxes for those type of projects. In fact, okay. those projects don't pay value added tax, they don't pay wealth tax, and if you stay with properties within that project for 10 years, you will not pay income tax over your income or your rental income, and you will not pay wealth tax over those 10 years. Okay. So, Which is a huge incentivization for the money or for the investors to stay inside the investment vehicle and actually not even pull it out. Mm. And there are very open economies. You same happens in Paraguay. So you don't. It doesn't matter if you invest as a person or as a partnership. So, so as an LLC or whatever type of partnership you have, yeah. is transparent for the investment. Okay, makes sense. Do you also, as a developer, work with real estate agents to promote it, or do you go yeah. directly to the investors? So for selling the units, we, yeah, we work with uh, agents, thousands of them, and we have our own salespeople within the company, but we have an open uh, policy. So we sell at exactly the same prices that the market uh, sells and the brokers sell. Uh, we charge the same commissions as the brokers. So we have a fair competition policy with everyone. And that's only for selling the units. So in terms of equity, uh, we do private placements by ourselves. So we have no involvement of third parties. Makes yeah. sense. Okay. The commission in Uruguay or respectively Paraguay, Argentina is around like 5% on the sales price. So it, it... there are different policies. For example, in Paraguay, it's very similar to the US where the buyer doesn't pay a commission, only the seller pays. And it's typically 6% that the seller pays, in, in this case, the project. And, in, and when we sell through a broker, we usually get a 1% and we pay the broker 5%. And in Uruguay, so it's half and half, 3% pays the project, 3% pays the buyer. And in Argentina, it's mostly the same, between 3 and 4% 4 pays the buyer. And the project typically pays around two to three uh, percent to the broker. So it depends on the geography, uh, but it's yeah. mostly like that. that. Makes sense. Okay. Perfect. Pere, thank you so much for your time so far. I learned a lot. You gave us a very interesting overview of the status of the entire region. Uh, I learned a lot again about Millet, uh, about the trend. Uh, I'm crossing fingers that uh, Argentina has a strong turnaround. You also taught me a lot about your company and your investment um, vehicles, as well as the opportunity for foreigners, especially to invest in a very easy and seamless way. Um, you also gave us a very good idea of how you work with agents. Do you have any final thoughts, any tips before we close this very interesting discussion, which so, things you might have um, not changed with us? Mm -hmm. You know, my thoughts are always around uh, technology and sustainability. So we, <clears throat> I believe this market is going through a huge transformation in that sense. Latin America is a little bit behind the, the wave. Europe has already started this process many years ago and has realized that we need to transform the way we do business in this market. And, and we have taken a huge step as a company 
in this sense. We are advising our investors to create uh, what, that when they create long-term portfolios, they focus on sustainability because those are the properties that are going to sustain value in the long term. So policies are going to come to every country regarding sustainability uh, and requirements for this. And we have uh, taken this decision many years ago. And so my, my first thought is if you are building long-term projects, long-term portfolios in Latin America, we are a, a great option to work on sustainability and technology. And, and we believe firmly on this and, and we are working a lot on the long term uh, in this respect. And I think Latin America has huge opportunities. Uh, the, the spreads here in terms of cost and sales are, are, are much larger than in the rest of the world. And it's a growing population everywhere. And we are here to continue growing. Perfect. How can people reach out to you? So we, we, you can write that info at uh, vitroncapital.com. I think that's the easiest way. Or in, uh, in our website, uh, www.vitroncapital.com, there are several ways to contact us. Perfect. Fede, thank you so much for your time. I'm really grateful for having had you on the show. And yeah, I'm looking forward also to have another session with you maybe in a month or two, which we then can also hold in Spanish to also address our Spanish speakers in Great. more seamless. Perfect. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Michael. Have a good day, sure. Fede. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. This video is brought to you by Holocasa. Our tool transforms independent local real estate agents to global real estate agents. Create your own profile for free and get contacted by international investors. Sign up with the link in the description.